I love this topic. So <laughs> how are we going to tackle the difficulties of deployment? But how is AI going to make this easier for us? <laughs> oh, gosh, I'll show you. Uh, first of all, for those of you who uh, uh, are passionate about YAML editing, um, and I know there's a lot of AI out there, uh, that, uh, you know, they, uh, you, you might be uh, disappointed at how well uh, the new AI tools actually create the YAML for you. Uh, and that's some of the things I'm going to demo today. Awesome. I'll demo a couple of other things as well, you know, um, uh, translating between uh, languages, translating between scripting formats and things like that. Cool. So, yeah. I'm yeah. They, at they, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> I was just going to say we've collaborated on demos before. I am really interested to see what you have cooked up for us for sure. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, we go way back. So uh, uh, different things we've been working on over the years. So that's great. Um, yeah. Should I get started? Or? Go ahead. All right. Okay. So uh, I think we have about 30 minutes and then we have 10 minutes for questions. So uh, what I'm going to go over today is um, basically how you actually create and deploy Kubernetes and I'm going to use AI to actually generate the Kubernetes deployment itself. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that in just a sec. So what we're looking at here on the screen, this is the Azure portal. Uh, so I work for Microsoft, I'm a cloud advocate, and um, I'm going to show you Azure today. But a lot of the things I'm going to show you here are applicable to any cloud platform or anywhere you're deploying to Kubernetes. Uh, but anyway, this is the cloud uh, portal that we have for Azure at portal.azure.com. If you aren't familiar with it, uh, you can sign up for a free trial uh, at portal.azure.com. Uh, and I'm, all of the code I'm going to show you today, by the way, if anyone wants to follow along at home, is at, um, there's a GitHub uh, site that I can show you. Uh, it's right there. Uh, oh, I just put it in the chat, but it uh, should show up in the chat. Uh, but basically, it's github.com slash bben slash cfe dash dev slash haunted slash devops. And I've got some scripts in there that I'm going to be using. So if you want to follow along with that, it's okay. Uh, so there's two ways you can create Kubernetes in Azure. I can go through the portal here, and I can just go click here and do it manually through the portal by pointing and clicking. Uh, if I go into containers... I can go create a Kubernetes service and it'll create a Kubernetes service. I can connect a, um, uh, I can connect a container registry to that as well, because you need a container registry to deploy things in general. Uh, or I can use Docker Hub to deploy as well. And I'm going to show you how to do it with Docker Hub today. Uh, and it'll actually generate what you see here. So this square here is a, it's a um, resource group that we have in Azure. And the resource group here has a Kubernetes service that I already pre-created. Uh, it has a container registry that I already pre-created. And it's got some monitoring, uh, Grafana, and some other things that you can use to track your Kubernetes deployments on this instance. Uh, a little bit about the Kubernetes service we have. You can deploy uh, to Kubernetes on virtual machines on Azure as well, of course, Linux or Windows. Uh, but Kubernetes itself uh, can be run using our Azure Kubernetes service. And basically what that does is take the control plane, the management plane, and manage that for you. So automatic upgrades um, and uh, management of your nodes and all of the things you see here from monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are built in. The nice thing about that is uh, you don't have to manage it yourself <laughs> uh, and you don't have to worry about upgrades and things like that. It'll actually take care of them for you. All you need to focus on are your nodes and your pods and ingress and things like that. Uh, it's very handy and there's no extra charge aside from the storage that you use. We don't charge for the service itself. It's just a uh, additional... Uh, offering that we have. So anyway, that's enough about our Azure Kubernetes service. So there's a way to do it through the portal. There's also a way to do it through the Azure CLI. You can also do it through Terraform. I'm going to show you some cool stuff about that later as well. Um, but here's my, my clone of the repo that I showed you earlier uh, on GitHub. 
And basically, this is the README. And I'm going to go through here and, and we're going to do a few things in our steps. And then I'm going to show you how AI can help you do this as well. So first of all, you set up an environment, you create an Azure Kubernetes service, you create an Azure Container Registry, and you deploy Cassandra to the Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, there's a couple of prerequisites. You have to have a Azure account and you have to install the Azure CLI. Uh, the first thing we do is just set up some uh, environment variables for our resource group, uh, for our Azure Container Registry, and for the source image that you're going to use for the virtual machine that runs your container registry. I'm sorry, your container, Kubernetes service, not the container registry. Uh, then you create a resource group using, using the Azure CLI. Um, you create an Azure Kubernetes service. And like I say, you can do this through the portal or through the script. Uh, and uh, AZ AKS create, you use the resource group you set up, you name it, you set up a location, you set up the VM size that you want, a virtual machine. And by the way, we have both um, x86 and ARM64 images that you can use for your Kubernetes service. So if you want to use ARM, it's a little bit more, um, power, a little bit less power hungry, a little bit more sustainable. Uh, that's a cool option to do as well. We have Ampere based ARM64 Ultra images uh, pre-made that you can use for Kubernetes as well as any virtual machines or anything like that. Uh, we're just gonna set up one node count and we're gonna generate SSH keys. And that allows us to um, get our credentials easier, easier than creating a manual key. <clears throat> so the next thing we do is AZ AKS install the CLI and then installs the Kube Control CLI into our um, Azure AKS service. And then uh, you get your credentials, which I've already done. Um, by the way, I'm looking at this in Visual Studio Code, and that's going to be pertinent in a minute. Uh, Visual Studio Code is a free download for those of you who might not know. Uh, if you just search for Visual Studio Code, you'll see that or VS Code. Um, then you set up your credentials, AZ, AKS, get credentials, uh, and it's going to set up the credentials so that you can use Kube Control directly into your newly created AKS cluster. I've already done that as well. And then you can create a Azure Container Registry. Like I said before, you can use Docker Hub, or you can use a Container Registry. Uh, and the Container Registry here is, in, in this case, a private registry. Uh, and... Um, you enable admin, and that means that you have a username and password for this. Then you can log into that container registry. You have to do that so you have access to it when you're actually going to start pushing things to it. Uh, next thing up is you attach the Azure Container Registry to the Azure Kubernetes service using this command. You just AZ AKS update, and this is the pertinent part of that. Attach ACR, uh, and so that's going to connect the ACR to the AKS so they can authenticate and work with each other. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to grab Docker. Uh, sorry, we want to use Docker to grab Cassandra. Uh, we're going to um, pull Cassandra in uh, using uh, just the Docker pull command. Uh, and then you're going to tag it and you're going to push it up to your container registry. This is optional. Uh, also, if you want to deploy from Docker Hub, uh, you can just deploy like this. Now, this is where we get into the AI part. So I want to skip over that stuff really, really quickly if, uh, if it's not obvious. Everyone can check out the, the script and, and the portal. There's lots of instructions on how to set that up. That's the basics. Now let's get into the AI stuff. Um, the AI stuff itself, if you notice over here in my repo, I don't have any YAML files or anything. And you need a YAML file to actually deploy this to Kubernetes. So for that, I want to introduce you to something called <coughs> Copilot Chat. So those of you who are familiar with Copilot, if you're not, it's basically uh, autocomplete uh, that is very, very, very enhanced. Uh, you can create whole pieces of code, which is nice. Um, you can create whole classes. Uh, it'll generate code for you, basically. Uh, but another thing that you can do now is Copilot Chat. So everybody's familiar with Chat GPT. They might have, you might have heard of it. Uh, but if you haven't, look it up. Uh, I'm pretty sure you are. Uh, those of you who have seen it know that there's sort of a chat function. You can ask questions of Chat GPT, and Chat GPT can actually reply with answers for things you're looking for. Well, <clears throat> Copilot has now integrated Chat into Visual Studio Code, uh, and there's a few other 
IDEs you can use as well. Uh, but we're going to focus on Visual Studio Code today. And there's several slash functions that you can use. Now, those of you who might have been around for a long time, like myself, uh, the slash functions are kind of interesting for me. Um, I am old enough to remember when Lotus123 and Excel used to have a slash menu. Uh, actually, a lot of applications used to have a slash menu. And uh, this kind of brings back a lot of memories for those, uh, for those of you out there who might have uh, been familiar with those. Uh, it was just a way of basically hitting slash and it would bring up a menu with a bunch of different options. And look at this, we've got a different setup for the same thing. Um, let me zoom in a little bit so folks can see this. So there's several slash functions that you can use um, that will help you work with your code. There's help, uh, there's tests, simplify, fix, explain, VS code, create notebook, create workspace and clear. Uh, I'm gonna go with a couple of these today, which is basically explain. And um, well, I've never used fix before. My code always works, it never. No. Anyway, uh, and simplify, of course my code's always as simple as it could be. Uh, and I'm sure most of you out there are the same. But uh, these are great tools. If you have some code that you just can't figure out, you just do slash explain, slash fix, slash simplify. And it actually brings up some pretty good suggestions. But today, we're just going to work on the code generation. Uh, and what I can do is I'll just grab... Oh, one of the things I should mention that this has an advantage over ChatGPT is context. So it knows right now that I'm in a certain file. It knows that my cursor is on this line and I can actually select things uh, and or ask about these other open items that I have here as well. But right now it knows that the context is here. So without much context, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, how do I deploy this to Kubernetes? It's looking at seeing what I'm working on right now. Okay, so uh, to deploy the Docker image to Kubernetes. Yeah. yeah, you see, now this is why I like doing AI demos. It doesn't always, it, it's basically kind of guessing what I want to do, but it's not really getting it. So let's try this, select that. It, it, sometimes you get a different result uh, depending on what you do. Uh, AI these days can be very capricious. And let me say a little bit about experience. So everyone, there's been a lot of talk about is AI going to replace developers? Um, it might, it, it, here's here's my, my take on that. I don't think it's going to replace developers, uh, but it will help junior developers learn and it will help senior developers be more productive. Uh, and the reason for that is I just need to know what's real and what's not. So... Uh, you know, you ask a question a dozen times, you can get a dozen different answers from AI. Uh, and uh, when you do that, uh, you have to know what the right answer is. You have to have some experience and or you're going to learn which one of those things is the right answer if you don't know. So that's my take on AI. It's not going to uh, it's really going to help, but it's not going to replace developers or admins or anything like that. So let's ask again. Uh, how. Do I this to now, last time I could just select the line and it figured out what I was trying to do. This time it basically took a shot at it. Okay, so this time it knows, oh, okay, you're doing a Cassandra and you want to deploy Cassandra. So um, you create a file named deployment YAML. You add the following content uh, and API version. Uh, it's a deployment and then Cassandra deployment. It's using the Cassandra app labeled Cassandra. It's going to use the Cassandra latest image and it's going to set up a container port of 9042. It's all right. Okay, so I need to know that this is correct, right? If I do this, then what I can do is I can insert into new file and now I can name this file. And I've got a specific thing I want to name it because I already have the prompt set up down here. Cassandra Deployment YAML. And I'll show you why I'm doing that in a second. Okay. File, save as. And it's going to go to GitHub. 
extended appointment with YAML. Okay. And then it said, what did it say to do? Okay, so you can say Kube Control apply deployment YAML. Let's do that. So I'll bring this down here. Uh, and it's in uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. Oh, wait. All right. So it's created a deployment for me. Um, great. All right. So it's deployed that. So now I can do things like um, it's going to take a second to run up to start up. But uh, basically, I can do a coup control get pods. OK, so there it is. It's running. I should have showed you this before, but there was absolutely nothing on this Kubernetes cluster. So I actually took a big big chance doing a live demo with AI. But basically, you can see how easy it is to generate that deployment and that YAML file. Um, but the other thing we want to do is, and this is once again where experience comes in, right? So uh, get services. So we have one service called Kubernetes. It's a cluster, it's a cluster IP. So we need to add a service, right? So the deployment's there. We've got three pods. That's nice. Uh, it's exactly what uh, it told us it would deploy uh, and it defaulted to three replicas. So it's there, but how do you actually access this thing? Now there's two options. You could use it as a backend database and you could build an application that runs on top of this um, and connects to the database. So you don't need access to the database directly, but let's say you wanna access Cassandra from HTTP. Well, you need a Kubernetes service for that. So um, let's ask again, how would I, it keeps the context, I hope, I uh, deploy a service for this. Okay, so deploy a service in Cassandra. All right. So uh, deploy a service for your Cassandra deployment in Kubernetes, you would typically create a Kubernetes service configuration file. Uh, yes, okay, and it creates the network rules for exposing your application to other applications or external users. Uh, in this case, we're gonna create this service. We're gonna once again, insert into new file, and we're gonna name this one Cassandra service YAML. Save as. Save. Okay. So now I've got a Cassandra service YAML. You go back to the README. You can say Kube Control Create. And it's actually going to create a service. So the service is now created. So then I can say, let's do this one again. So we've got our pods here now. We've got our pods running, three pods. And then we can say services. So now we have Cassandra running. And we've got a cluster IP address for that on port 9042. So you can connect to this from an application or internally. Uh, and um, everything should work. Okay, uh, so that's basically what we have to set that up. Now you see how easy that was. So this is how AI really helps you uh, when you're looking at deploying things. So we have a Cassandra service, uh, we have a Cassandra deployment, and everything's up and running. So what are some of the other things you can do uh, with this? So one of the things I was gonna show you as well uh, this is all in the Azure CLI, which is very specific to Azure. But what if you want to have sort of a multi-cloud uh, deployment for this? The Kubernetes infra.az CLI is the actual command that I've created that edits and builds this for you. Um, the it, it basically goes through, by the way, the uh, little bit of trivia, let a lot of folks know this, but the AZ CLI extension uh, can be used in Visual Studio Code and other formats for creating resources and things like that 
that are going to be used in an Azure CLI. And it helps with um, type ahead and with other things as well. Uh, so AZ AKS create um, the resource group itself. I can convert this, for example. I can say, so I've got this open now. Let's go back to our chat. And without asking it, you know, let's change in the context or anything. How would I uh, execute this and spell it right in Terraform? It's going to look at this now. It's going to go, oh, okay. So it knows it's an Azure CLI script from the extension and a few other things. And basically, it's going to create Terraform for me to do this, which is kind of nice. Uh, so initialize the directory in the main TF file, Terraform init, Terraform apply. Tells you how to do every step. Uh, and it creates the things that you want to name it. Uh, and uh, even gives you some, some suggestions here on basically how would you actually deploy this and connect to it. Um, what else can I show you here? Uh, oh, Pulumi as well. So. You can do, by the way, you can do up arrow, just like, you know, uh, those of you familiar with Bash, Pulumi. So you can do the same thing for Pulumi. So you create a new TypeScript base formula, uh, formula uh, program, and it'll actually create the Pulumi for you. So you can imagine how easy this is and how nice this is for, uh, helping you with your application development. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so let's go back to the infra. So we've got our Cassandra service here. Uh, we've got our, well, basically our Cassandra service. What I wanna do is I wanna ask it now, how would I connect to this with a Java application? This is where it gets a little hairy because when you're looking at Copilot and other things that actually does. Okay. So, by the way, just a little bit of trivia. Cassandra is actually written in Java, for those of you who might not know. Uh, and uh, there's various reasons for that, but uh, you can check that, that out as well. Uh, so, to connect to a Cassandra database from a Java application, you can use the Datastax Java driver for Apache Cassandra. Okay. Uh, there's a basic example of how you can establish a connection. All right. Are there any other ways? Okay. Spring data, using Spring data. Uh, and it tells you how to set up the properties and the contact points as well. Uh, and those say, um, show me an application, please. What the, so let's say, please. Let's be polite to the AI because, you know, someday we'll all be working for it. So uh, please uh, create a hello world. Please create hello world code that connects to this Cassandra service using spring data. All right. Yeah, that's still not. Okay. Oh, okay. It does. All right. Great. Okay. So uh, now, theoretically, we could look at this. So it actually generates the whole thing. Okay. This is better than, it, than the last time I tried this. Like I say, AI can be very capricious. So uh, it's kind of interesting how things work. Uh, but, you know, I've got basically nothing up my sleeve here. We're building this out completely from scratch. And there we go. So this is the Hello World class. Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay. And then let's go Cassandra config class. 
we can set this up. Uh, we'll just create new Cassandra config. Okay. Ba -ba -ba. Wow. Save as. I don't know if this is going to work the first time, but. In here no okay gotta get okay save that all right so i'm gonna go through the step by step actually i'm not going through exact steps uh but then we're going to go to the that's cassandra config and then we're going to have the hello world. Oh, let's just start from the top again. So that's the palm. All right. See, this is where things are kind of incomplete. So this is not a full, full, full uh, palm. Okay, so we'll have to do that. Uh, but this is a Cassandra config, and this is a hello world. Okay, we already got this. Wow. Save as. Java. Okay. And when you set up the properties file, where's that? Okay. Wait, what's this? Yeah, we got that. Where's the properties? Okay. Anyway, let's do this. I didn't really do everything together. So this is where experience comes in because you need to be able to build this from the pieces it gives you basically. It's it's basically taking this box of options here and dumped it on my desk and now I gotta figure out what to do with it. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Okay. So we do need to have the application properties file. That's gonna have to be there as well. This is not a complete application by the way. So, um, I, you know, it doesn't have the formats and the structure that you would have in a complete application. And this is a good example of AI and the limitations thereof. Uh, so that's important to know as well. Um, but anyway, I think that's that gives you an idea. Um, basically, you have to set up the properties and you have to set up a complete palm.xml. This is only a segment of the palm.xml that you need. Uh, and this is, uh, and, and it didn't include the properties this time. It did the last time I asked. Uh, so there's a number of things that you need to know how to work with uh, and you need to know what a Spring Boot application looks like. You need to know what a Spring Data application looks like and be able to put all the pieces basically together that it gives you. But I think that's a good example of the, uh, the kinds of things we have. Um, so what I'll do now is I'm actually going to go into Visual Studio Code and I will commit this. And uh, if anyone wants to play around with this, it'll be there and you can use it. Um, I'm going to generate something a little bit later that uh, is completely working using the you know, go to start.spring.io, generate the code, and then plug this code into it. And basically, that's what you'd have to do. But we're a little bit out of time. I know we have some uh, time for questions here, and I want to make sure we could cover that as well. Uh, let me just say uh, Java and YAML code. All right. Commit. And just gonna have to ask me if I want to stage my stuff, and I do. I'm gonna sync the changes. All right, so everything should be out there now on the uh, GitHub page that's posted. It's a well, it will be there in a second anyway. And that's this one here: uh, B Ben's CFE Dev Haunted DevOps. Uh, you can find that at uh, 
github.com slash bvan slash cfe dev haunted devops with dashes. And uh, I guess that's about it. We've got 10 minutes for questions. And uh, yeah, what'd you think? <laughs> that was awesome, Brian. I love how demo heavy your presentations are just because we get to see what real life really looks like. And Absolutely. Yeah. this yeah. is definitely something I needed. Um, I don't know if you know anyone else in the obvious in the audience feels the same way, but like yeah. a lot of times I dive into things like this and I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. <laughs> you know, just kind yeah. of poke at it, see what happens. So this is a really good example of just how to, you know, start playing around with AI uh, while coding. Um, if yes. you have any questions in the audience, feel free to ask. I will definitely present them to Brian. In the meantime, I have some of my own for sure. Um, absolutely appreciate that you call out AI for being imperfect. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It feels like it's like a mash between Googling the internet and skimming through Stack Overflow, right? Like you yeah. still need to know what you're doing. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but what would you say, you know, improvement, like being able to use the chat in this way, uh, what would you say is an improvement over what I just described, just Googling or uh, oh, skimming? Just being chat? able to, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was done. <laughs> I, I jumped in too soon. But um, yeah, no, just being able to, uh, you know, figure out what the code does. So one thing I didn't show, I'll show real quick here. Uh, so I can do things like I can click on Cassandra's service. And I go to the chat and say slash explain. Uh, and it'll actually explain what this code does uh, for those of, you know, for folks who might not know. So the provided code is a Kubernetes service, configuration written in YAML. It knows it's a service and not a deployment. Um, and it describes in detail everything about what this does. Uh, and then you can do something like... Uh, simplify. So this is where it's a little bit better than ChatGBT. Um, I don't know if it's going to be able to simplify this. It's already quite minimal and straightforward. Okay. So, oh, yeah, it did. It made it even shorter. Oh, you can use a Helm chart. So it actually recommends that you use a Helm chart as well. Um, and that's interesting. So that's not shorter or simpler, but yeah, you know. So yeah, it's a great example of, you know, the way things are. Um, that's cool. I can yeah, see it's, yeah. Go ahead, sir. I could see an advantage for like, you know, if you're new on a project, you know, yeah. you brought down all this source code and you just need, you know, quick explanation of how things are working. This yes, yes. And, and actually, I was joking about it, but fix is really useful too, because sometimes you just have a misspelled variable or something. You slash fix, and it'll look at the code and it'll tell you, ah, this variable you can't find it anywhere else in your open files. So, you know, it'll, it'll tell you things like that. And it'll even sometimes put a little uh, um, Git style uh, replace uh, there for you as well. So, Have you had a situation yet where you think you know what code does and you ask it to explain it to you and it's not what you thought at all? <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good at explaining. I mean, it catches things that you might not, you know, uh, yeah. and uh yeah, the scary thing about AI, you know, it works 24 hours a day. It just knows so much more. It's seen so much more code than even the most experienced developer in the world. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it could just figure things out that, that you know, you might not have caught, things you missed uh, about what the code does or where a problem might be and things like that. Uh, and it works with pretty much every programming language. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. So I showed you Pulumi. Uh -huh. uh, Terraform, uh, anything, anything. You want to convert this to another cloud provider, CLI, you can do that as well. It'll just, it'll take the code and go, yeah, sure, here you go. And, you know, the things like that take hours and it takes seconds with this. So it's a, it's like having a really, really experienced sort of pair programmer. Yeah, uh, that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, we, you know, suffer from a lack of um, pairs, so to speak. Uh, yeah. I, I see this being really valuable on that front for sure. Um, you were using VS Code for this. Can we yeah. use any other IDE? I know I have yeah. my favorites. Yeah, no. Um, the uh, uh, There's several things you can use. You can use, if you're a Java developer, IntelliJ IDEA as well. Um, and uh, there are uh, others as well. Let's, let's ask. Hey. Uh, 
what IDEs is cool. And this is actually this is uh, this is interesting because you know we're we're used to our, uh, it, they I've heard some things about well, no 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 <laughs> what about other IDEs so it's just basically told me it runs in Visual Studio Code I know that uh, but yeah uh... <laughs> oh. <laughs> well official support oh boy see so this is where AI fails you so there are some other uh, IDEs you can use. Uh, just a sec. What, what are they? Um, the, uh, GitHub. I know there's more. Uh, I just can't remember what they are right now. Um, I know IntelliJ IDEA has an extension, uh, and there's a couple others as well. One that's popular with Node. Ah, oh, boy, I didn't, I wasn't ready for this. So, um, so Vim and NeoVim, uh, Visual Studio Code, JetBrains, and something called Azure Data Studio. Those are where you can run Copilot at the moment. Um, but um, there might be other platforms coming soon. Uh, but basically, this is where you can get it. You can also use. Um, I know we're running out of time. Uh, I did want to show you this one thing you can do as well. If I go into my GitHub repo. So this is the repo. Uh, you can also, uh, instead of cloning, we have this thing called code spaces. I can create a code space of this repo. And basically what this does is it creates a clone of the repo in a container that's running in a browser uh, and it has extensions for Copilot and Copilot chat. So you can actually run this here as well. So if you don't have access to an IDE or you're on, I know a lot of like government agencies and stuff really lock down their machines and they might not have Copilot or any of the other, or I'm sorry, any of the other IDEs that can run Copilot. Um, what you can do here, so this is a basically a cloned repo. I can go to extensions and I can say Copilot. And I can install Copilot. Where's Copilot Chat? I think it's part of just Copilot now. Oh, there it is. Okay, so it's automatically installed. So Copilot Chat. Let me zoom in on this for the folks out there. Uh, so Copilot and Copilot Chat. I just installed it here. Uh, so now I can go back to my code up here. And I can do this again. I can go to chat. And I can say slash explain. And so it works in the browser as well. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it's it's all there, fully functional. And you have most of the things that you have uh, in Visual Studio Code itself, but in a code space. Uh, and then what if I want to, I can, I can change any of this and I commit it back to the repo again. Now remember, because it's it's in a browser, uh, it's, it's not the actual code you're working with in GitHub. It's a clone. And it will clone it back. Uh, and when I close this, it will actually know that I have, let's hope. Um, yeah. So it knows that there's a code space out there already. And then I can come back and just pick up where I left off. I can wow. also open up this code space in IntelliJ IDEA and um, also in um, uh, Visual Studio Code, of course, and all the other formats that the Copilot works in. So that's ah, pretty cool. Um, I haven't played with code spaces at all yet. So that was cool. I'm glad that you showed that for sure. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's uh, it's really something that really helps with productivity. And you can preset your environments as well. Okay. So you can preset the environment for, um, for the different uh, things that you want. Like maybe you want uh, the Copilot to be installed, uh, ready to go, or you want some Java uh, capabilities built in, or Red Hat, or all kinds of things. You can actually predefine your environment uh, in code spaces when you build it. Wow. So, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I think I'm left mostly impressed with just how well, you know, it generated the YAML files and stuff. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, 
other than it telling you the truth 100% of the time, <laughs> yeah. there's something specific that you wish it did that you haven't found yet? Uh, it's a good question. Um, yeah, there are a few things. Uh, it would be nice if there was more uh, context and if it was more um, consistent, uh, that would be nice as well. You know, uh, the, the consistency is an issue. I mean, I tried, you know, you saw there was a couple of the parts that just didn't work right. Right. Uh, that should have worked and uh, just didn't go the way you expected. Yeah. Uh, I've heard yeah. that before that you'll ask it something once and then it might give you a different answer. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's like a human being. It's a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah. We It'd be that. nice if they would ask you clarifying answers. Like, uh, you know, do you want the same answer that, you know, we gave you last time or do you want a new answer or something? Right. Like right. So it would be a little more interactive, but I guess that's one feature. Yeah.